With the series as tried and true as The Legend of Zelda, different interpretations of its story are inevitable. Some good, some bad, whether it's above the clouds or below the waves. But one has always stood out from the rest. <clears throat> a disturbingly bleak iteration that no other Zelda has come close to replicating. With unsettling characters in an equally off-putting world, and a storyline so edgy it's left the internet with nothing to say but... Wow, that was really dark and moody. Yeah, I know, right? It's been said so much at this point it's almost a joke rather than an actual description. But, you know what? They're not wrong. Majora's Mask is dark and moody. The only problem is, rarely have I seen someone articulate why. Now, Majora's Mask was released in 2000, just two years after Ocarina of Time. I was nine years old at the time, and Ocarina had already solidified itself as my gaming standard. Based on the critical acclaim it garnered, it's safe to say I wasn't alone. In fact, it was the most highly regarded game at the time, and to this day it still ranks right up there on most lists. That being said, the appreciation for Ocarina did nothing to ease the fear that Majora would never reach the same heights. Unbeknownst to my nine-year-old mind, I steamrolled from Ocarina right into Majora upon its release, unaware of the weight it was saddled with. There was plenty of skepticism to be thrown around, seeing as the game had such a quick turnaround. This was due in large part to Nintendo reusing many of the assets from Ocarina. Now this is by no means a bad thing. The idea of taking what you've already made and applying it to something new is a double-edged sword. I would understand if someone interpreted this as a lazy tactic. Nintendo understood this and took what we knew from Ocarina and created something unique. Now if you went into Majora having not played Ocarina, you wouldn't pick up on this. Which is fine, it just means that you more than likely had a different experience. In essence, that's what Majora was attempting to do, provide you with something fresh. However, if you played Ocarina, seeing all the same characters didn't cheapen the experience. Rather, it enhanced it in a startling way. At the beginning of the game, Link leaves Hyrule and after a series of unfortunate events, finds himself in the land of Termina. Despite an array of misfortunes befalling him in the process, he arrives in this new land only to run into people he knows. Except none of them remember him in return. The very fact of recognizing everyone around you despite being in a foreign land is surreal enough. Add to that all the trouble you've dealt with during your travels and it compounds into this blob of uncertainty. We're in this strange place, yet so many faces are familiar. It's a deliberate way of unsettling you from the get-go, and it was oh so smart of Nintendo to use Ocarina's assets this way. More than the characters being familiar, though, they also exhibit a greater range of, well, character. In Ocarina, most of the characters are largely bystanders. They're not doing much of anything important and don't have much of anything interesting to say. And that's fine. Ocarina is a different beast compared to Majora. Not every game needs a large cast of characters that all adhere to a grander set of rules. Yet this change to characters being more lifelike in Majora adds to the jarring nature the game presents and helps to provide more contrast with Ocarina. Majora is full of a plethora of characters with their own schedules, concerns, and motives in the face of adversity. With what's at stake around you, it makes these characters all the more interesting and developed, and it aids the story splendidly. Even the most simple characters have an interesting tidbit or two of dialogue. For example, the lovey-dovey, way-too-cutesy dancing couple that owns a shop in East Clocktown? After getting perfect scores on their game's three days running, they give you a heart piece as a literal piece of their heart. After giving you the prize, though, the woman says to the man, are we truly happy? They're just shop owners, yet they say something like that? <laughs> uh, all right, I hope you guys have a happy life. How do I get out of here? Your friend Navi in Ocarina? She's just like, hey, listen. And is your best bud from the start until you complete your journey and she flies off without a word, prompting this nightmarish quest. Thanks a lot, Navi. See, even the premise of this game is sad. It's great. Yet in Majora, your fairy companion Tattle is nasty towards you from the start. Helping Skull could take your stuff, getting you turned into a Deku scrub, and all right, enough. You done? Because your friends are leaving you behind. Yeah. Good job, Dippy. To get back to her brother, she has to cooperate with you, aiding you how she can and giving you snappy advice in the process. But the more you experience together, the more she warms up to you. By the time you reach the game's climax, you've formed a closer bond than you ever did with Navi. And I appreciate the change this lends to improving the story. While characters are an inevitable focus of Majora's Mask, they're not the only thing in the game that instill these strong emotions in us. There are plenty more aspects that do this, and some of them start from the very beginning. 
Within the first 30 minutes or hour, the entire game is set up in such a way that you know exactly what you're getting into. Rather, if this acid trip wasn't enough to clue you in, there are a plethora of additional subtle hints aimed not only at subverting your expectations, but world building. Right as you're about to enter Clocktown for the first time, the happy mask salesman shows up and utters one of the most memorable lines in the entire series. Spine-tingling as his appearance is, he shines a tiny ray of light your way when he tells you he can bring you back to your original form. The only problem is, he'll only be around for three days before he has to pack up his belongings and move on. This is important. At this point in the game, unless you had watched the introductory cutscene in its entirety or seen any promotional material, there was no indication the moon was going to crash in three days' time. There's even a panned shot once you step into town looking upwards above the clock tower and you don't see a thing. It's not as if you'd step outside and click up C like, oh, I wonder if there's an evil moon staring down at me. It's just not a natural inclination. I'm going to say this more than once in this video. But this is genius. The entire beginning sequence of the game is set around figuring out what trouble the Skull Kid has been up to so you can get to him and get your ocarina back. Three days isn't exactly a whole lot of time, but the stress of finding one Skull Kid around town doesn't match the stress of knowing there's impending doom floating overhead. So the natural process you'll likely go through at the start is to talk to everyone you can to see what's going on. In many games, that's a standard convention for getting small hints on where to go or what to do. However, the more people you talk to, the more things seem awry. By the time you get to the observatory and look through the telescope, the picture becomes a whole lot clearer. What's brilliant about all of this is the moon's presence was never hidden. You can look up and see its disgusting grimace at any time. Yet the subtle ways the story guides you along in the initial stages makes the reveal that much more impactful. While this only applies to a first time playthrough, it's these design choices that make me appreciate the subtleties a game can hide in its many layers. While all of this does wonders in creating that wonderful ooze of darkness and edginess that we love about Majora, there's one aspect that's the real kicker to all of this, and it happens to be the thing that divides the most amount of opinions on it. It's about time we talked about time. As the centerpiece for the entire game, time and how you control it is the most important aspect. It enhances the characters in a meaningful way, provides the greatest amount of stress for the player, and magnifies the oppressive darkness through subtle design choices. Every character has a scripted routine for the three days the world is still around. As you learn about what they do and where they'll be, you can act accordingly to manipulate their schedules in your favor. Typically, this is done to obtain a heart piece, mask, or other reward. Now, all things considered, the N64 isn't the most powerful system. The game requires the expansion pack to even play it, and there are still various problems even with this added firepower. As a result, the characters cannot react dynamically to Link's actions, yet they feel more alive than any random NPC in recent games because they're in fact set to a schedule. You see them attempt to go about their lives like any normal person would, even in the face of certain doom. There's a human characteristic to how they all operate and react to the changes around them. Even as the end of the world approaches, this helps you identify with them. Yet the act of resetting time is where the real darkness lies. You can see this within the game's side quests. With the eclectic cast Majora has, you need more than one three-day cycle to complete them all. This requires resetting time at some point so you can start right when everyone's schedules are wound back to their initial moment. The thing is though, the second you go back in time, every character forgets about the interactions they had with you. Say you help the farm from aliens on the first day. If you talk to Romani, she'll reveal that there are aliens coming to nab the cows. She then asks for your help defending them since her sister doesn't believe her. And of course, you say yes. She gave you a nickname even though you just met her. I mean, come on, you can't say no to that. Getting another bottle isn't a half bad reward either. The next day after saving the cows, if you show up at the ranch in the evening, her older sister, Kremia, will ask if you want to join her as she delivers milk to Clocktown. Good thing she doesn't know that you defeated the aliens, letting her make the delivery in the first place. It's not long into the ride that you realize the road has been blocked off, forcing her to take a long way around. This is when the Gorman brothers strike, trying to steal the milk. Again, you assume the role of protector, fending them off until you reach the town. As a reward, you get the Romani mask, a symbol of the friendships you've made. You create these bonds with them that only you, the player, will take with you. Then just like that, you reset time and they vanish. You know why people say this game is depressing? There's a reason. What I find interesting is you feel rushed for time when you play Majora's Mask. Yet, as the controller of time, you only need to set it back to give yourself the chance at something again. All the while, the end of the world is no closer because you keep resetting it. Time is literally in your hands. Despite feeling rushed to save the world, it's almost ironic because you actually have all the time in the world to make things right. In this way, you, the player, are still rushed to complete things. But the story is in fact not being rushed at all because you can do whatever you want. 
So, you can return time to its original state, giving you a clean slate going forward. The only problem is there's always going to be that evil looming overhead. Let's talk about the moon for a second. The moon is the embodiment of hopelessness, casting its evil shadow over the entire game. It's always above you, a reminder of the unenviable task you face. Since you have to repeatedly start time over to save Termina, you continue to see the moon hanging over you each time. Even though its closeness to you is decreased at the start of a new three-day cycle, it's still going to be there, and it'll get close again. In this way, despite the fact that you will eventually succeed, there's this feeling that you will fail over and over again. This only adds to the helplessness of the entire situation you face. I feel that in some way this aspect of the game has affected and subsequently halted people from continuing their quest. And I believe that was the goal in mind. Majora certainly isn't trying to lift your spirits. And you know what? I like that. There's one last thing I want to talk about, and it's one of my favorite things in a video game. The last bit that encapsulates the doom and gloom you feel is compounded into this. This single effect is so powerful because it invokes the sensation that time is slipping right through your fingers. It's as if there's no way to stop it, even though you can simply turn time back to zero. It only adds to the themes of death and helplessness that pervades the game, and it's all capped off by the text appearing, which reaffirms just how much time you've got left. And that's all I have to say about it. It's simple, it's genius, I love it. Much like I love this entire game, Majora's Mask is the dark, depressing oddity in the Zelda series, and the game wanted these emotions to weigh heavily on those that played it. It's no surprise that the same thoughts are conveyed to this day. There were a plethora of smart design choices put in place between the characters, story, and time mechanics that make Majora alive with feeling. With the recently announced 3DS remake on the way, I'm excited that a whole new generation of gamers will finally get to experience the despair, the wonder, and the magic that is Majora's Mask. And despite how much the game might try to bring you down, playing it brings me nothing but happiness. I have fond memories of waking up early on the weekend, making myself some Pop-Tarts, and sinking hours into the game. Ocarina might have set my standards for gaming as a whole, but Majora's Mask solidified my love for the Zelda series.